We're doing much ado about nothing. Is everyone excited? Oh, extremely so. Woo! Woo. I'm so glad to have all you guys here. You're all some of my favorite people ever. Um, So our amazing cast is made up of these lovely people. And uh, I am so excited to be hosting. Uh, I will be narrating. Um, Leonardo will be played by Miguel. Say hello, Miguel. Hello. Beatrice will be played by Joanna. Hello, all. Messenger will be played by me. Hero will be played by Natasha. Hello. Don Pedro will be played by Mike. Hello. Benedict will be played by Gabe. Hello. Claudio will be played by Hannah. Hey there. I love it. Um, Don John will be played by Mike. Hello. (laughs) Conrad will be played by Joanna. Yeah. Horatio will be played by Gabe. Hey, hey. Margaret will be played by me, Brooke. Hello. <laughs> Doc Barry will be played by Miguel. Hello again. Virgis will be played by Natasha. Hi. First Watchman will be played by Mike. Hello. <laughs> Second Watchman will be played by Hannah. Hey, yo. A sexton will be played by Brooke, me. Friar will be played by Hannah. Hello there. <laughs> now I'm your host, narrator Brooke. Um, so before we begin, announcements. Uh, Miguel, if you want to start with your announcement. Sure. Um, I'd like to share that the Tales of Trilitus, a seven book sci fi fiction series for children written by Wally Larson Jr. is about to finish production. Books one through six have already been done done as eBooks and the audiobooks are available. Book seven is in production presently. And uh, yours truly, the narrator, should have it done by the end of the month with an expectation to have it on the shelves, if you will, by November. So the entire set will will be available for Christmas. (laughs) Woo! Talking stuff for there. So, that's Tales of Trilitus, go check it out. Go check it Tales out. Tales of Trilitus by Wally Larson Jr. narrated by Miguel Rodriguez. Yes, ma'am. Woo-hoo. Leave a review. Mm-hmm. Yes, and leave a review. Um, <clears throat> by all means. On Audible and Amazon. Books are on It's Amazon. available on iTunes, Amazon, and Audible.com. Yes. Woohoo. Tales of Trilitus, go check it out. Um, Acting United is producing our first film, um, and definitely not the first film of. Uh, my own or our director Griffin Watson Um, but we are producing a film we're currently raising money we need 10k uh, to get it off its feet and make it into a full-fledged production to raise awareness for human trafficking I'm so excited we're gonna do it and shoot it in March 2022 so um, make sure to check out our campaign on Indiegogo Uh, it's called Elena so E-L-E-N-A a human trafficking awareness film, go check it out on Indiegogo. And if you can't give, $1 helps. But even if you can't give that, share it, get the word out. So without further ado, here is much ado about nothing. (laughs) Act one, scene one, before Leonardo's house. Enter Leonardo, Hero, and Beatrice with a messenger. A messenger has arrived to announce the return from battle of the prominent Don Pedro, his brother Don John, and several soldiers, including Benedict and Claudio. Beatrice, niece to Leonardo, and cousin to Hero, speaks out. Uh, I pray you, is Signor Montanto returned from the wars or no? I know none by that name, lady. There was none such in the army of any sort. What is he that you ask for, niece? My cousin means Signor Benedict of Padua. Hmm. Oh, he's returned, and as pleasant as ever he was. Uh, I pray you, how many hath he killed and eaten in these wars? But 
How many hath he killed? For indeed, I promised to eat all of his killing. Faith, niece, you taxing your Benedict too much, but he'll be meet with you, I doubt it not. Mm -hmm. He hath done good service, lady, in these wars. You had musty victual, and he hath hoped to eat it. He's a very valiant trencherman. He hath an excellent stomach. And a good soldier too, lady. And a good soldier to a lady. But what is he to a lord? A, a, a lord to a lord, a man to a man, stuffed with honorable virtues. It is so indeed. He is no less than a stuffed man. But for the stuffing, well, we are all mortal. You must not, sir, mistake my niece. There is a kind of merry war betwixt Signor Benedict and her. They never meet, but there's a skirmish of wit between them. I will hold friends with you, lady. <laughs> Do, good friend. You will never run mad, niece. <laughs> no, not till a hot January. Don Pedro is approached. Good Signor Leonardo, you are come to meet your trouble. The faction of the world is to avoid cost, and you encounter it. Never came trouble to my house in the likeness of your grace. For trouble being gone, comfort should remain. But when you depart from me, sorrow abides, and happiness takes his leave. You embrace your charge too willingly. I think this is your daughter? Her mother hath many times told me so. Were you in doubt, sir, that you asked her? Signor Benedict, no. For then were you a child. I wonder that you will still be talking, Signor Benedict. Nobody <sighs> marks you. What, my dear lady, disdain? Are you yet living? Is it possible disdain should die while she hath such meat food defeated as Signor Benedict? Oh. Courtesy itself must convert to disdain if you come in her presence. Then courtesy is a turncoat. But it is certain I am loved of all ladies, only you excepted. And I would I could find in my heart that I had not a hard heart, for truly I love none. Let me bid you welcome my lord. Being reconciled to the prince, your brother, I owe you all duty. Thank you. I am not of many words, but I thank you. Please it your grace, lead on. Your hand, Leonardo. We will go together. Exit. All except Benedict and Claudio. Benedict, oh. does thou know the daughter of Signor Leonardo? I noted her not, but I looked on her. Be not a modest young lady. <laughs> do you question me as an honest man should do for my simple, true judgment? Or would you have me speak after my custom as being a professed tyrant to their sex? No, no I, pr I pray thee speak in sober judgment. In mine eyes, she is the sweetest lady I ever looked on. I can see yet without spectacles, and I see no such matter. There's her cousin, as she were not possessed with a fury. Exceeds her as much in beauty as the first of May doth the last of December. But I hope you have no intent to turn husband, have you? <laughs> <laughs> I would scarce trust myself. Though I had sworn the contrary, if Hero would be my wife. Is it come to this? In faith, hath not the world one man, but he will wear his cap with suspicion? Shall I never see a bachelor of three score again? Go to, in faith, and thou wilt needs thrust thy neck into a yoke, wear the print of it, and sigh away Sundays. Uh, look, Don Pedro has returned to seek you. <clears throat> Re-enter Don Pedro. Oh, it's me. Don Pedro notices a change in tone between his soldiers, Claudio and Benedict. He soon learns that Claudio has fallen in love with Hero and promises to disguise himself as Claudio and to woo Hero in Claudio's name. Benedict, meanwhile, continues to forswear love entirely. <sighs> that a woman conceived me, I thank her. That she brought me up, I likewise give her most humble thanks. But all women shall pardon me. 
because I will not do them the wrong to mistrust any. I will do myself the right to trust none. And the fine is, for the which I may go the finer, I will live a bachelor. I shall see thee, ere I die, look pale with love. <laughs> with anger, with sickness, with hunger, my lord, not with love. Prove that I ever, that ever I lose more blood with love than I will get again with drinking. Pick out mine eyes with a ballot maker's pen and hang me at, at the door of a brothel house for the sign of blind Cupid. Well, you will temporize with the hours. In the meantime, good Signor Benedict, repair to Leonardo's. Commend me to him and tell him I will not fail him at supper, for indeed he hath made great preparation. I have almost matter enough in me for such an embassage, 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 and so I leave you. Exit. The same. Scene three. Enter Don John and Conrad. Oh, that's me again. Now we meet Don John, the unhappy, overlooked brother of Don Pedro. A good ear, my lord. Why are you thus out of measure sad? There is no measure in the occasion that breeds. Therefore, the sadness is without limit. You should hear reason. And when I have heard it, what blessings bring it? Oh, if not a present remedy, at least a patient sufferance. I wonder that thou goest about to apply a moral medicine to a mortifying mischief. I cannot hide what I am. I must be sad when I have cause and smile at no man's jests. Eat when I have stomach and wait for no man's leisure. Sleep when I am drowsy and tend on no man's business. Laugh when I am merry and claw no man in his humor. Yea, but you must not make the full show of this till you may do it without controlment. You have of late stood out against your brother, and he hath taken you newly into his grace, and where it is needful that you frame the season for your own harvest. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood to be disdained of all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. In this, though, I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man. It must be, it must not be denied, but I am a plain dealing villain. I am trusted with a muzzle. Therefore, I have decreed not to sing in my cage. If I had my mouth, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am and seek not to alter me. Can you make no use of your discontent? <laughs> I make all use of it, for I use it only. Who comes here? Enter Boratio. What news, Boratio? Boratio conspires with Don John. He gives him intelligence of the intended wooing of Hero and marriage to Claudio. Don John replies, Come, come, let us thither. This may prove food to my displeasure. That young startup hath all the glory of my overthrow. If I can cross him anyway, I bless myself every way. Exit. Act two, scene one. A hall in Leonardo's house. Enter Leonardo <laughs> and Beatrice and others. Was not Count John here at supper? Oh, I saw him not. How tartly that gentleman looks. I never can see him, but I am heartburned an hour after. He's of a very melancholy disposition. He were an excellent man that were made just in the midway between him and Benedict. Uh, the one is too like an image and says nothing. The other, too like my lady's eldest son, evermore telling. By my troth, niece, thou wilt never get thee a husband if thou be so shrewd of thy tongue. <laughs> For the which blessing I am at him upon my knees every morning and evening. Lord, I could not endure a husband with a beard on his face. I'd rather lie in the woolen. You may light on a husband that hath no beard. <laughs> what should I do with him? Dress him in my apparel and make him my waiting gentlewoman? <laughs> he that hath a beard is more than a youth, and he that hath no beard is less than a man. And he that is more than a youth is not for me, and he that is less than a man, I am not for him.
Antonio. Oh, Antonio. Uh, wow. I didn't cast this person. How did I not cast this person? Uh oh. Anybody? Someone pick it up. Well, niece, I trust you will be ruled by your father. <laughs> yes, Faith. It is my cousin's duty to make curtsy and say, Father, as it please you. But yet for all that, cousin, let him be a handsome fellow or else make another curtsy and say, Father, as it please me. The revelers are entering, brother. Make good room. All put on their masks. Enter Don Pedro, Claudio, Benedict, Don John, Boratio, Margaret, Ursula, and others masked. Lady, <laughs> will you walk about with your friend? So you walk softly and look sweetly and say nothing. I am yours for the walk, and especially when I walk away. With me and your company? I may say so when I please. And when please you to say so? When I like your favor, for God defend the loot, should be like the case. My visor is Philemon's roof. Within the house is Jove. Why, then, your visor should be thatched? Speak low if you speak love. The party has begun. The soldiers meet and woo the women of the house from behind their party masks. Don Pedro pretends he is Claudio. Boratio meets up with heroes serving women. Margaret? Woman, Margaret. And Beatrice and Benedict continue their quarrel even while in disguise. Don John leads Claudio down his road of displeasure, saying that Don John has wooed Hero for her, his own ends. But Don Pedro is quick to put things right for Claudio and Hero and even becomes inspired to make a love match between Benedict and Beatrice, drawing her aside. Well, I would you did like me. So would not I, for your own sake, for I have many ill qualities. Mm, I wish he's one. I say my prayers aloud. I love you the better. The hearers may cry. Amen. God match me with a good dancer. Amen. <laughs> and God keep him out of my sight when the dance is done. Answer, clerk. <laughs> no more words. The clerk is answered. Beatrice. Beatrice. Will you not tell me who told you so? No, you shall pardon me. <clears throat> Nor will you not tell me who you are? Not now. That I was disdainful and that I had my good wit out of the hundred merry tales. <laughs> well, this was Signor Benedict that said so. Uh, what's he? I'm sure you know him well enough. Oh, not I, believe me. Did he never make you laugh? Uh, I, I pray you, what is he? Oh, why? He is the prince's jester, a very dull fool. Only his gift is in devising impossible slanders. None but libertines delight in him, and the commendation is not in his wit, but in his villainy. For he both pleases men and angers him, them, and then they laugh at him and beat him. <laughs> when I know the gentleman, I'll, I'll tell him what you say. Good. The lady Beatrice hath a, qu hath a quarrel to you. The gentleman that danced with her told her she is much wronged by you. Oh, she'd misuse me, the past endurance of a block. <sighs> An oak, but with one green leaf on it would have answered her. My very visor began to assume life and scold with her. She told me, not thinking I had been myself, that I was Prince's jester, that I was duller than a great thaw, huddling jest upon jest with such impossible conveyance upon me that I stood like a man at a mark with a whole army shooting at me. She speaks poniards, and every word stabs. If her breath were as terrible as her terminations, there were no living near her. She would infect to the North Star. I would not marry her, though she were endowed with all that Adam had left him before he transgressed. Look, here she comes. Enter Claudio, Beatrice, Hero, and Leonardo. Uh, will your grace command me any service to the world's end? I will go on the slightest errand now to the antipodes that you can devise to send me on. I will, I, 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 I'll fetch you a toothpicker now from the furthest inch of Asia rather than hold three words conference with this harpy. You have, <laughs> you have no employment for me? None, but to desire your good company. 
Oh, good sir, there's a dish I love not. I cannot endure my lady's tongue. Exit. Come, lady, come. You have lost the heart of Signor Benedict. Indeed, my lord. He lent it me a while, and I gave him use for it. A double heart for this single one. Mary, once before, he won it of me with false dice. Therefore, your grace may well say I have lost it. You have put him down, lady. You have put him down. Though I would not, he should do me, my lord, lest I should prove the mother of fools. I have brought Count Claudio, whom you sent me to seek. Here, Claudio, I have wooed in thy name, and fair hero is won. I have broke with her father, and his goodwill obtained. Name the day of marriage, and God give thee joy. Count, take of me my daughter. And with her, my fortunes, his grace hath made the match. And in grace say amen to it. Speak, Count. Tis your cue. Mm. Silence is the perfectest herald of joy. I were but little happy if, if I could say how much. Lady, as you are mine, I am yours. I give away myself to you and I dote upon the exchange. Speak, cousin, or if you cannot, stop his mouth with a kiss and let not him speak neither. In faith, lady, you have a merry heart. <laughs> Yea, my lord, I thank it, poor fool. It keeps on the windy side of care. My cousin tells him in his ear that he is in her heart. And so she doth, cousin. Good Lord, for alliance. Thus goes everyone to the world but I, and I am sunburnt. I may sit in a corner and cry, hey ho, for a husband. <laughs> Beatrice, exit. I'm my trove, a pleasant spirited lady. There's a little of the melancholy element in her. My lord, she is never sad, but when she sleeps, and not ever sad then. For I have heard my daughter say, she hath often dreamed of unhappiness, and waked herself with laughing. She cannot endure to hear tell of a husband. Oh, by no means. She mocks all her wooers out of suit. She were an excellent wife for Benedict. Oh, lord, my lord. If they were but a week married, they would talk themselves mad. County Claudia, when means you to go to church? Tomorrow, my lord. Time goes on crutches till love have all his rights. Not till Monday, my dear son, which is hence a just seven night, and a time too brief, too, to have all things answer my mind. Um... You shake the head at so long a breathing, but I warrant thee, Claudio, the time shall not go dully by us. I will, in the interim, undertake one of Hercules' labors, which is to bring Signor Benedict and the Lady Beatrice into a mountain of affection the one with the other. I would fain have it a match, and I doubt not but to fashion it, if you three will but minister such assistance as I shall give you direction. My lord, I am for you. And I, my lord. And you too, gentle hero? I will do any modest office, my lord, to help my cousin to a good husband. And Benedict is not the, mo the unhopefulest husband that I know. Thus far can I praise him. He is of a noble strain, of approved valor, and confirmed honesty. I will teach you how to humor your cousin that she shall fall in love with Benedict, and I, with your two helps, will so practice on Benedict that, in despite of his quick wit and his queasy stomach, he shall fall in love with Beatrice. If we can do this, Cupid is no longer an archer. His glory shall be ours, for we are the only love gods. Go in with me, and I will tell you my drift. It. Scene three, Leonardo's Orchard. Enter Benedict. 
I do much wonder that one man, seeing how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviors to love, will, after he hath laughed at such fellow folly, shallow follies in others, become the argument of his own scorn by, fi- by falling in love. And such a man is Claudio. I have known when there is no music with him, but the drum and the fife. And now he had rather hear the tabor and the pipe. I've known when he would have walked 10 mile afoot to see a good armor. But now will he lie 10 nights awake, carving the fashion of a new doublet? He was wont to seek plain and to the purpose, like an honest man and a soldier. And now he's turned to... Orthography. His words are a very fantastical banquet, just so many strange dishes. May I be so converted and see with these eyes? I cannot tell. I think not. I will not be sworn, but love may transform me into an oyster. But I'll take my oath on it. Till he have made an oyster of me, he shall never make me such a fool. One woman is fair, yet I am well. Another is wise, yet I am well. Another virtuous, yet I am well. But till all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come into my grace. (laughs) Oh, oh, the prince and monsieur love. Um, I will hide me in the arbor. (laughs) withdraws don pedro claudio and lirado enter so you were benedict hath hit himself oh very well my lord come hither leonardo what was it you told me of today that your niece beatrice was in love with signor benedict oh i stock on stock on the faucets i did never think that a lady would have loved any man no nor i neither but most wonderful that she should dote on Signor Benedict, whom she hath in all outward behavior seemed ever to abhor. Is it possible? Sits the wind in that corner? By my troth, my lord, I cannot tell what to think of it, but that she loves him with an enraged affection. It is past the infinite of thought. Maybe she doth but counterfeit. Faith, like enough. Oh, God, counterfeit. There was never counterfeit of passion came so near the life of passion as she discovers it. Why, what effects of passion shows she? Bait the hook well, the fish will bite. What effects, my lord? She will sit you. You heard my daughter tell you how. She did indeed. How, how, pray you, you amaze me. I would have thought, I would have, I thought her spirit had been invincible against all assaults of affection. I would have sworn it had, my lord, especially against Benedict. I'd think this a gull. But that the white-haired lady speaks it, knavery cannot sure hide himself in such reverence. He had taken the infection. Hold it up. Hath she made her affection known to Benedict? No, and swears she never will. That's her torment. Tis true indeed. So your daughter says, Shall I, says she, that I so oft encountered him with scorn, write to him that I love him? This she says now, when she is beginning to write to him, for she'll be up twenty times a night. And there will she sit in her smock till she have writ a sheet of paper. My daughter tells us all. Oh, she tore the letter into a thousand halfpence, railed at herself, that she should be so immodest to write to one that she knew would flout her. I measured him, says she, by my own spirit, for I should flout him if he writ to me, yea, though I love him, I should. Then down upon her knees she falls, weeps, sobs, Beats her heart, tears her hair, pray, curses. Oh, sweet Benedict, God give me patience. She doth indeed. My daughter says so. 
and the ecstasy hath so much overborne her that my daughter is sometime afeard she will do a desperate outrage to herself. It is very true. Hmm. It were good that Benedict knew of it by some other, if she will not discover it. <laughs> to what end? He would not make a sport of it and torment the poor lady worse. Never tell him, my lord. Let her wear it out with good counsel. Nay, that's impossible. She may wear her heart out first. Mm. Well, we will hear further of it by your daughter. Let it cool the while. I love Benedict well, and I could wish he would modestly examine himself to see how much he is unworthy so good a lady. Mm. My lord, will you walk? Dinner is ready. If you do not dote her upon this, I will never trust my expectation. <laughs> Let there be the same net spread for her, and that must your daughter and her gentlewomen carry. The sport will be when they hold one an opinion of another's dotage and no such matter. That's the scene that I would see, which will be merely a dumb show. <laughs> Let us send her to call him in to dinner. <laughs> Exit Don Pedro, Claudio, and Leonardo. This can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. They have the truth of it from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have their full bent. <laughs> Love me? <laughs> Why? Oh, it must be requited. I hear how I'm censured. They say I will bear myself proudly if I proceed to love come from her. They say, too, that she would rather die than give any sign of affection. I, I, I never did think to marry. <laughs> I, I must not seem proud. Happy are they who hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They, 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 they say the lady's fair, and tis true that I can bear the witness. And virtuous, tis so, I cannot reprove it. And wise, <laughs> but for loving me... <laughs> And by, by my troth, it's no addition to her wit nor great argument from her folly, <laughs> for I will be horribly in love with her. I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me, because I've so railed so long against marriage. But doth not the appetite alter? Here comes Beatrice. <clears throat> By this day, she's a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. Enter Beatrice. <clears throat> Against my will, I've been sent. Bid you come into dinner. Fair, fair, Beatrice. <laughs> I thank you for your pains. Took no more pains for those thanks than you take pains to thank me. If it had been painful, I would not have come. Oh, you take pleasure that <clears throat> pleasure in the message. Yea, just so much as you may take upon a knife's point and choke a doll withal. You have no stomach, Signor. Fare you well. <laughs> Exit. <laughs> <laughs> against my will i am sent to bid you to come to dinner there's a double meaning in that i took no more pains than for those remarks thanks than you took pains to thank me <laughs> that is much to say any pains that i take for you is as easy as thanks <sighs> If I do not take pity of her, I am a villain. If I do not love her, I'm a Jew. And I will go get her picture. <laughs> Exit. Act three, scene one. Leonardo's garden, enter hero, Margaret, and Ursula. Good Margaret, run thee to the parlor. There shalt thou find my cousin Beatrice. Proposing with the prince and Claudio, whisper her ear and tell her, 
I and Ursula, walk in the orchard and our whole discourse is all of her. Say that thou overheardst us and bid her steal into the pleached bower to listen our purpose. This is thy office. Bear thee well in it and leave us alone. I'll make her come. I I warrant you. Presently. Now, Ursula... When Beatrice doth come, as we do trace this alley up and down, our talk must be only of Benedict. When I do name him, let it be thy part to praise him more than ever man did merit. My talk to thee must be how Benedict is sick in love with Beatrice. Of this matter is little Cupid's crafty arrow made, that only wounds by hearsay. Enter Beatrice behind. Now begin. For look where Beatrice, like a lapwing, runs close to the ground to hear our conference. Oh. Right. Right, that's supposed to be me. Fear you not, my part of the dialogue. Then go we near her, that her ear lose nothing of the false sweet bait that we lay for it. Approaching the bower. And skip to page 25. Similarly, Ursula and Hero convince Beatrice to accept Benedict's vows of love. However, in another part of town, a plot continues to destroy the love of Hero's marriage to Claudio. Exit, scene two. A room in Leonardo's house. Horatio has returned to John John with a villainous plot to dishonor Hero by having Margaret play her part as a disloyal lover to Claudio. Don John now enters to lead his brother and Claudio into a wedding betrayal. Enter Don John. Lord and brother, God save you. Good den, brother. <laughs> if your leisure served, I would speak with you. In private, if it please you, yet Count Claudio may hear for what I would speak of concerns him. What's the matter? Means your lordship to be married tomorrow. You know he does. I know not that when he knows what I know. If there be any impediment, pray you discover it. You may think I love you not. Let that appear hereafter and aim better at me by that I now will manifest. For my brother, I think he holds you well. And in dearness of heart hath hoped to effect your ensuing marriage. Surely suit ill spent and labor ill bestowed. Why, what's the matter? I came hither to tell you. The lady is disloyal. Who? Hero? Even she. Leonardo's hero, your hero. Every man's hero. Disloyal? The word is too good to paint out her wickedness. I could say she were worse, think you of a worse title, and I will fit it to her. Wonder not till further warrant. Go but with me tonight. You shall see her chamber window entered, even the night before her wedding day. If you love her then, tomorrow wed her. But it would better fit your honor to change your mind. May this be so? I will not think it. If you dare not trust that you what that you see, confess not that you know. If you will follow me, I will show you enough. And when you have seen more and heard more, proceed accordingly. If I see anything tonight, why should I marry her tomorrow in the congregation where I should wed? There I will shape her. And as I wooed for thee to obtain her, I will join with thee to disgrace her. I will disparage her no farther till you are my witnesses. Bear it coldly but till midnight, and let the issue show itself. Oh, day untowardly turned. Oh, mischief strangely thwarting. Oh, plague right well prevented. So will you say when you have seen the sequel. Exit. Scene five. Another room in Leonardo's house. Enter Leonardo with Dogberry and Verges. What would you with me, honest neighbor? 
Marry, sir. I would have some confidence with you that discerns you nearly. Brief, I pray you, for you see, it is a busy time with me. Marry, this is it. This it is, sir. Yes, in truth it is, sir. What is it, my good friends? Good man verges, sir, speaks a little off the matter. An old man, sir, and his wit, sir, mm, not so blunt as God help I would desire they were, but in faith, honest as the skin between his brows. Yes, I thank God I am as honest as any man living that is an old man and no honester than I. Comparisons are odorous, palabras, neighbor verges. Neighbors, you are tedious. It pleases your worship to say so, but we are the poor duke's officers. But truly, for mine own part, if I were as tedious a king, I could find it in my heart to bestow it all of your worship. All thy tediousness on me, huh? Yeah, and twere a thousand pound more than tis for I hear as good exclamation on your worship as of any man in the city. And though I be but a poor man, I am glad to hear it. And so am I. I would fain know what you have to say. Harry, sir, our watch tonight, accepting your worship's presence, hot a couple as errant knaves as any in Messina. A good man, sir. He will be talking, as they say, when the age is in, the wit is out. God help us. It is a world to see. Well said I, faith, neighbor verges. Well, God is a good man, and two men ride of a horse, one must ride behind. An honest soul of faith, sir, by my troth he is, as ever broke bread. But God is to be worshipped. All men are not alike. Alas, good neighbor. Indeed, neighbor, he comes too short of you. Gifts that God gives, I must leave you. One word, sir, our watch, sir, have indeed comprehended two auspicious persons, and we would have them this morning examined before your worship. Take their examination yourself and bring it me. I am now in great haste, as it may appear unto you. It shall be suffigents. Drink some wine ere you go. Fare you well. Enter Antonio. Brother, they stay for you to give your daughter to her husband. I'll wait upon them. I am ready. Exit Leonardo and messenger. Go, good partner, go. Get you the sexton. Bid him bring his pen and ink horn to the gold. We are now to examination these men. And we must do it wisely. We will spare for no wit. I warrant you only get the learned writer to set down our excommunication and meet me at the goal. Exit. Act four, scene one. A church. Enter Don Pedro, Don John, Leonardo, Friar, Francis, Claudio, Benedict, Hero, Beatrice, and attendants. Come, Friar Francis, be brief, only to the plain form of marriage, and you shall recount their particular duties afterwards. You come hither, my lord, to marry this lady? No. <laughs> to be married to her, Friar. You come to marry her. Lady, do you come hither to be married to this count? I do. If either of you know any inward impediment why you should not be conjoined, charge you on your souls to utter it. <clears throat> know you any hero? N none, my lord. Know you any count? I dare make his answer. None. Stand thee by, friar. Father. By your leave, will you, with free and unconstrained soul, give me this maid, your daughter? As freely, son, 
As God did give her me. And what have I to give you back? Whose worth may I counterpoise this rich and precious gift? Nothing, unless you render her again. Sweet prince, you learned me noble thankfulness. There, Leonardo, take her back again. Give not this rotten orange to your friend. She is but the sign and semblance of her honor. Behold, how like a maid she blushes here. Oh, what authority and show of truth can be cunning sin over itself withal. Come not that blood as modest evidence to witness simple virtue. Would you not swear? All you that see her, that she were a maid by these exterior shows, but she is not. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed. Her blush is guilt, guiltiness, not modesty. What do you mean, my lord? Not to be married, not to be knit, not to knit my soul with an um, unproved wanton. Is my lord well, but he doth speak so wide? <laughs> Sweet prince, why speak not you? What should I speak? I stand dishonored that have gone about to link my dear friend to a common stale. Are these things spoken, or do I but dream? Madam, they are spoken, and these things are true. This looks not like a nuptial. Hath no man's dagger here a point for me? Hero swoons. Why how now, cousin? Wherefore sink you down? Come, let us go. These things come thus to light. Smother her spirits up. Exit Don Pedro, Don John, and Claudio. How doth the lady? Dead, I think. Help, aunt! Hero! Why, hero! Aunt Senior Benedict, Friar! O oh, fate, take not away thy heavy hand. Death is the fairest cover for her shame that may be wished for. Oh, wow, cousin hero! Come, comfort, lady. Oh, on my soul, my cousin is belied! Lady, were you her bedfellow last night? No, truly not, although until last night I have this twelve month been her bedfellow. <sighs> Confirmed. Confirmed. Oh, that is stronger maid, which was before barred up with ribs of iron. Would the two princes lie, and Claudio lie, who loved her so that, speaking of her foulness, washed it with tears? Hence from her. Let her die. Hear me a little, for I have only been silent so long and given way unto this course of fortune. By noting of the lady, I have marked a thousand blushing apparitions to start in her face, and a thousand innocent shames and in angel whiteness beat away those blushes. Pause a while, and let my counsel sway you in this case. Your daughter here, the prince is left for dead. Let her well be secretly kept in, and publish it that she is dead indeed. Maintain a mourning ostentation, and on your family's old monument, hang a mournful epitaph, and do all rites that appertain unto a burial. What shall become of this? What will this do? Mary, this is well carried, shall on her behalf change slander to remorse. That is some good. But not for that dream I on this strange course, but on this travail look for greater birth. She is dying, as it must be, so be maintained upon the instant that she was accused, shall be lamented, pity, and excused of every hearer. For it so falls out that what we have we prize not to the worth whilst we enjoy it, but being lacked and lost, why, then we rack the value and that we find the virtue that possession would not show us while it was ours. So it will ever Claudio, when he shall hear she died upon his words, the idea of her life shall swiftly creep into his study of imagination, and every lo 
lovely organ of her life shall come apparelled in more precious habit, more moving, delicate, and full of life into the eye and prospect of his soul than what she lived indeed. Then shall he mourn in ever love interests in his liver and wish he had not so accused her the common lady died to live this wedding day perhaps it is but not prolonged have patience and endure uh, exit all but benedict and beatrice Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? Yea, and I will weep a while longer. I would not desire that. You have no reason. I do it freely. Surely I do believe your fair cousin is wronged. <laughs> ah, how much might the man deserve of me that he would write her? Is there any way to show such friendship? A very even way. But no such friend. May a man do it? It is a man's office, but not yours. I do love nothing in the world so well as you. <laughs> is that not strange? As strange as the thing I know not. It was possible for me to say I love nothing so well as you, but believe me not. And yet I lie not. I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing. I am sorry for my cousin. By my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Do not swear it and eat it. I will swear by it that you love me and I will make him eat it that says I love not you. Will you not eat your word? No sauce that can be devised to it. I protest. I love thee. Oh, thank God forgive me. What a fat, sweet Beatrice. You stayed me in a happy hour. I was about to protest I loved you. Then do it with all thy heart. I love you with so much of my heart that none is left to protest. Come, bid any me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio. Fuck for the wide world. You kill me to deny it. Farewell. Terry, sweet Beatrice. I am gone, though I am here. There is no love in you. Nay, I pray you, let me go. Beatrice. In faith, I will go. We'll be friends first. <laughs> you dare easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy. Is Claudio thine enemy? Is he not approved in the height of villain that hath slandered, scorned, dishonored my kinswoman, all oh, that I were a man? What, bear her in hand until they come to take hands and then, with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancor? No! Oh, God, if I were a man, I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Enough. I am enraged. I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand. And so I leave you by this hand. Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me. Go. Comfort your cousin. I must say she is dead. And so farewell. Exit. Scene two. A prison. Enter Dogberry, Verges, and Sexton. In gowns and the watch with Conrad and Horatio. Is our whole assembly appeared? Oh, a stool and a kitchen cushion for the Sexton. Which be the male factors? Marry that I am I and my partner. Nay, that's certain. We have the exhibition to examine. Uh, but which are the offenders that are to be examined? Let them come before Master Constable. Yea, Mary, let them come before me. What is your name, friend? Baraccio. Pray, write down Baraccio. Yours, sirrah? 
I am a maid, sir. My name is Conrad. Write down Mistress Maid Conrad. Master and Mistress, do you serve God? Yes, Yay, sir. sir. We, we hope. hope. <laughs> write down that they hope they serve God and write God first. For God defend, but God should go before such villains. Masters and mistresses, it is approved already that you are little better than false knaves, and it will go near to be thought so shortly. How answer you for yourselves? Mary, sir, we say we are none. A marvelous witty woman, I assure you. But we'll go about with him. Come you hither, sirrah, a word in your ear, sir. I say to you, it is thought you are false knaves. Sir, I say to you, we are none. Well, stand aside. For God, they are both in a tale. Have you written down that they are none? Uh, Master Constable, you go not the way to examine. You must call forth the watch that are their accusers. Yea, Mary, that's the elfest way. Let the watch come forth. Masters, I charge you in the prince's name. Accuse these men. This man said, sir, that Don John, the prince's brother, was a villain. Write down Prince John a villain. Why, this is flat perjury to call a prince's brother villain. Master Constable. Pray thee, fellow peace. I do not like thy look. Act five, scene one, before Leonardo's house. Enter Don Pedro and Claudio. Really quickly, uh, skip this page and go to 37 beneath it because the, the Conrad oh, in watch right. wasn't finished. Right. I promise thee my last three words. Got it. What heard you him say else? Mary, he said that he had received a thousand ducats of Don John for accusing the lady hero wrongfully. Flat burglary as ever was committed. Way, you're an ass. You're an ass. Dost thou not suspect <laughs> my place? Dost thou not suspect my years? Oh, that he were here to write me down an ass. But masters, remember, that I am an ass, though it be not written down, yet forget not that I am an ass. No, thou villain, thou art full of piety, as shall be proved upon thee by good witness. I am a wise fellow, and which is more an officer, and which is more a householder, and which is more as pretty a piece of flesh as any in Messina, and one that knows the law go to, and a rich fellow enough go to, and a fellow that hath had losses, and one that hath had that hath two gowns and everything handsome about him. <laughs> Bring him away. Oh, that I had been writ down an ass. An ass. Yes. Exit. Back <laughs> up to page 38. Act five, scene one before Leonardo's house. Enter Don Pedro and Claudio. See, see. Here comes the man we went to seek. Enter Benedict. <laughs> Shall I speak a word in your ear? God bless me from a challenge. You are a villain. I just not. I will make it good how you dare with what you dare, when you dare. Do me right or I will protest your cowardice. You have killed a sweet lady and her death shall fall heavy on you. Let me hear from you. I must I, 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 I must discontinue your company. Don John, your brother the bastard has fled from Messina. You have among you killed a sweet and innocent lady. For my Lord Lackbeard there, he and I shall meet. Until then, peace be with him. Exit. He is an artist. In most profound earnest, and uh, I'll warrant you for the love of Beatrice. And have challenged thee. Most sincerely. 
but soft you let me be pluck up my heart and be sad did he not say my brother was fled enter dogberry verges and the watch with conrad and Boratio. come you sir Sorry, what page are we on? Don Pedro. How now? Now skip it. Hearken after their offense, my lord. Officers, what offense have these two done? Mary, sir, they have committed false report. Moreover, they have spoken on untruths. Secondarily, they are slanders. Sixth and lastly, they have buried a, belied a lady. Thirdly, they have verified unjust things. And to conclude, they are lying knaves. Wait, Prince, let me go no further to mine answer. Do you hear me? Let this count kill me. I, I have deceived even your very eyes. What your wisdoms could not discover, these shallow fools have brought to light. Who in the night overheard me confessing to this man how Don John, your brother, incensed me to slander the lady hero? How you were brought into the orchard and saw me caught Margaret on here in hero's garments? How you disgraced her when you should marry her? Don Pedro. Well, this speech like iron through your blood. I drunk poison whilst he uttered it. But did my brother set thee upon onto this? Yeah, uh, he paid me richly for the practice of it. Enter Leonardo. I thank you, princess, for my daughter's death, recorded with your high and worthy deeds. Twas bravely done, if you bethink you of it. I. I know not how to pay your patience, yet I, I, I must speak. Choose your revenge yourself. Impose me to what penance your revenging can lay upon my sin, yet sinned I not, but in mistaking. By my soul, nor I. And yet to satisfy this good old man, I would bend under any heavy weight that he'll enjoin me to. I cannot bid you bid my daughter live. That were impossible, but I pray you both. Possess the people in Messina, hear how innocent she died. And if your love can labor aught in sad invention, hang her an epitaph upon her tomb and sing it to her bones. Sing it tonight. Tomorrow morning come you to my house. And since you could not be my son-in-law, be yet my nephew. My brother hath a daughter, almost a copy of my child that's dead, and she alone is heir to both of us. Give her the right you should have given her cousin. And so dies my revenge. Oh, no, sir. Y your overkindness doth wring me from tears. I do embrace her offer and dispose for her henceforth a poor Claudia. God restore you to health. I humbly give you leave to depart, and if a merry meeting may be wished, God prohibit it. Come, neighbor. Exit Dog Dogberry and Verges. Until tomorrow morning, lords, farewell. We will not fail. Exit, severally. Scene two, Leonardo's garden. Enter Benedict and Margaret meeting. Pray thee, sweet mistress Margaret, to deserve well at my hands by helping me to the speech of Beatrice. Will you then write me a sonnet in praise of my beauty? In so high a style, Margaret, that no man living shall come over it. For in most comely truth, thou deserve it. To have no man come over me? Why, shall I always keep below stairs? <laughs> Thy wit is as quick as a greyhound's mouth. <laughs> it catches. And yours is blunt as a fencer's foils, which hit, but hurt not. 
a most manly wit, Margaret. Uh, it will not hurt a woman. <laughs> and so I pray thee, call Beatrice. I, 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 I give thee the bucklers. <laughs> give us the swords. We have the bucklers of our own. You will use them, Margaret. You must put in the pikes with a vice, and they are dangerous weapons for maids. Well, I will call Beatrice to you, who I think hath legs. <laughs> and therefore, will come. <laughs> Exit Margaret. Sings. The gods of love that sits above and knows me and knows me how pitiful I deserve. I mean in singing, but in loving, Leander the good swimmer, Troilus the first employer of panders, and a whole book full of these quantum carpet mangers. Is this a song? Is this like a, a monologue now? Or does he start? Yeah. Or is this all the song? Okay. I mean, either way. Either way. I'll retake that. <clears throat> I love it though. <laughs> The God of love that sits above and knows me and knows me how pitiful I deserve. <sighs> I mean in singing, but in loving Leander the good swimmer, Troy Troilus, the first employer of panders, and a whole book full of those quantum carpet mangers, whose names yet run smoothly, even in the row in the even road of a blank verse. Why they were never so truly turned over and over as my poor self in love. Mary. I cannot show it in rhyme. I have tried. I can find no rhyme to lady but baby. An innocent rhyme for scorn, horn, a hard rhyme. For school fool, a babbling rhyme. For very ominous endings. No, I was not born under a rhyming planet, nor can I woo in festival terms. Enter Beatrice. It's sweet Beatrice. Uh, would thou come uh, when I call thee? Yea, senor. And depart when you bid me. Oh, but stay till then. Then it's spoken. Fare you well now. And yet, ere I go, let me go with what I, with that I came, which is with knowing what hath passed between you and Claudio. Only foul words, and thereupon I will kiss thee. Foul words is but foul wind, and foul wind is but foul breath, and foul breath is noisome, therefore I will depart unkissed. <laughs> Thou hast frightened the word out of his right sense, so forcibly, uh, forcible is thy wit, but I must tell thee plainly, Claudio undergoes my challenge, and either I must shortly hear from him, or I will subscribe him a coward, and I pray thee now tell me for which of my bad parts didst thou first fall in love with me <laughs> for them all together which maintain so politic a state of evil that they will not admit any good part to intermingle with them but for which of my good parts did you first suffer love for me suffer love <laughs> a good epithet <sighs> i do suffer love indeed for I love thee against my will. In spite of your heart, I think. <laughs> Alas, poor heart. If you spite it for my sake, I will spite it for yours, for I will never love that which my friend hates. Thou and I are too wise to woo peaceably. It appears not in this confession. There's not one wise man among 20 that will praise himself. An old, an old instance, Beatrice, that lived in the lime of good neighbors. If a man do not erect in his age his own tomb ere he dies, he shall live no longer in monument than the bell rings and the widow weeps. And how long is that? Thank you. Question. Why an hour in clamor and a quarter in room? Therefore, it is most expedient for the wise, if Don Worm, his conscience, find no impediment to the contrary, be, to be the trumpet of his own virtue, says I am to myself. So much for praising myself, who, I myself will bear witness, is praiseworthy. 
And now tell me, who doth your cousin, or how doth your cousin? Very ill. And how do you? Very ill, too. Serve God. Love me and mend. There will I leave you, too. For here comes one in haste. Oh. Scene three, a church. Enter Don Pedro, Claudio, and three or four with tapers. Is this the monument of Leonato? It is, my lord. <clears throat> Done to death by slanderous tongues was the hero that here lies. Death in guerdon of her wrongs gives her fame which never dies. So the life that died with shame lives in death with glorious fame. Have thou there upon the tomb praising her when I am dumb? Now music sound and sing your solemn hymn. Pardon, goddess of the night, those that slew thy virgin night, for the witch with songs of woe round about her tomb they go. Midnight, her sister moan, help us to sigh and groan. Heavily, heavily, graves yawn and yield your dead, till death be uttered. Heavily, heavily. Now unto thy bones, good night. Yearly will I do this right. Good morrow, masters. Put your torches out. The wolves have prayed, and look, the gentle day before the wheels of Phoebus. Round about dapples the drowsy east with spots of gray. Thanks to you all, and leave us. Fare you well. <clears throat> Good morrow, masters, each his several way. Come, let us hence and put on other weeds, and then to Leonato's we will go. Hyman now with luckier issue speeds than this for whom we rendered up this woe. Exit. Scene. A room in Leonardo's house. Enter Leonardo, Antonio, Benedict, Beatrice, Margaret, Ursula, Friar, Francis, and Hero. Did I not tell you she was innocent? So are the prince and Claudio, who accused her upon the error that you heard debated. But Margaret was in some fault for this, although against her will, as it appears in the true course of all the question. Well, I am glad that all things sort so well. So am I, being else by faith enforced to call young Claudio to a reckoning for it. Well, daughter, and you, gentlewomen, all. Withdraw into a chamber by yourselves, and when I send for you, come hither, masked. Exit, ladies. The prince and Claudio promised by this hour to visit me. You know your office, brother. You must be father to your brother's daughter, and give her to young Claudio. Which I will do with confirmed countenance. Friar, I must entreat your pains, I think. Uh, to what, senor? To bind me, or undo me, one of them. Signor Leonato, truth it is, good senor. Your niece regards me with uh, an eye of favor. <laughs> that I, my daughter, lent her. Tis most true. And I do with the eye of love requite her. The sight whereof I think you had from me from Claudio and the prince. But what's your will? Your answer, sir, is enigmatical. But for my will, my will is your good will. My stand with ours may stand with ours. This day to be conjoined in the honorable state of marriage, in which, good friar, I shall desire your help. My heart is with your liking. And my help. Oh, here comes the Prince of Claudio. 
Enter Don Pedro and Claudio and two or three others. Good morrow to this fair assembly. Good morrow, Prince. Good morrow, Claudio. We here attend you. Are you yet determined today to marry with my brother's daughter? I'll hold my mind. Were she in Ethotope? Ethiopia? Call her fourth brother. Here's the friar ready. Exit Antonio. Good morrow, Benedict. Why, what's the matter that you have such a February face? So full of frost and <clears throat> storm and cloudiness. I think he thinks upon the savage bull. Tush, fear not, man. We will tip thine horns with gold, and all of Europa shall rejoice with thee, as once Europa did that lusty Jove, when he would play the noble beast in love. Old Jove, sir, at an amiable low. Some such strange bull leaped your father's cow and got a calf in that some noble feet, much like to you, for you have just his bleat. For this I owe you. Uh, here comes the other reckonings. Re-enter Antonio with the lady's mask. Which is the lady I must seize upon. The same as she, and I do give you her. My, then she's mine. Sweet, let me see your face. No, that you shall not, till you take her hand before this friar and swear to marry her. Give me your hand. Before this holy friar, I am your husband, if you like of me. And when I lived, I was your other wife. And when Unmasking. you loved, and when you loved, you were my other husband. Another hero? Nothing certainer. One hero died defiled, but I do live. And surely as I live, I am a maid. A former hero? hero? Hero that is dead? She died, my lord, but whilst her slander lived. All oh, this amazement I can qualify. When after that lady of the holy rites were ended, I'll tell you largely of fair hero's death. Meanwhile, let wander seem familiar to the chapel let us presently. Uh, soft and fair, friar. Which is Beatrice? Unmasking. I answer to that name. What is your will? Do you not love me? Why, no. No more than reason. <laughs> Why, then, your uncle and the prince and Claudio have been deceived. They swore you did. Do you not love me? Troth, no! <laughs> No more than reason. Why then, my cousin Margaret and Ursula are much deceived, for they swore you did. They swore that you were almost sick of me. They swore that you were well nigh dead for me. Tis no such matter, then you do not love me? No, truly, but in friendly recompense. Come, cousin. I am sure you love the gentleman. And I'll be sworn upon that he loves her, for there is a paper written in his hand. A halting sonnet of his own pure brain fashioned to Beatrice. And here's another writ in my cousin's hand, stolen from her pocket, containing her affection unto Benedict. <laughs> uh, a miracle. <laughs> here's, here's our own hands against our hearts. Come, I will have thee. By this light, I take pity for thee. I would not deny you, but by this good day, I yield upon great persuasion, and partly to save your life, for I was told you were in a consumption. Peace, I will stop your mouth. Kissing her. <laughs> <laughs> How dost thou, Benedict the married man? I'll tell thee what. Prince, a college of wit crackers cannot flout me of my humor. Dost thou think I care for a satire or an epigram? No. If a man will be beaten with brains, I shall wear nothing handsome about him. 
in brief, since I do propose to marry, I think nothing to any purpose that the world can say against it. And therefore, never flout at me for what I have said against it. For a man is a giddy thing. And this is my conclusion. For thy part, Claudio, I did think to have beaten thee. But in that thou art like to be my kinsman, live unbruised, and love my cousin. I had well hope thou wouldst have denied Beatrice that I might have could tell thee out of thy single life to make thee a double dealer, which out of the question thou wilt be, if my cousin do not look exceedingly narrowly to thee. Come, come, we are friends. Let's have a dance that we're married, that we may lighten our own hearts and our wives' heels. We'll have dancing afterward. First of my word. Therefore, play music. Prince, thou art sad. Get thee a wife, get thee a wife. There is no staff more reverend than one tipped with horn. Intermessenger, my lord, your brother John is taken in flight and brought with armed men back to Messina. Thank not of him till tomorrow. I'll devise the brave punishments for him. <laughs> Strike up, Pipers. Dance. Exit. End. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> oh my gosh, guys, that was amazing. Like Woo! seriously, I'm freaking blown away. You all are so talented. That was nice fun. P nice, nice PDF hopscotch too. That was pretty smooth. Oh, I know. <laughs> the pages will be in order next time, guys. Uh. Don't speak so soon. <laughs> now, and I'll read the title of the play as soon as you print it in the first message. <laughs> Ooh, um, well, uh, I, 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 honestly, I yeah. feel like. Uh, a doll's house maybe next so if you guys are interested let me know um, i'm unfamiliar so i'll start studying up on very that. good good play. very very good, good. choice the alt house is very is a very good play also Ooh. shakespeare no it's actually a oh, realism ibsen. play who is um, it henrik ibsen ibsen henrik ibsen yes <laughs> It was there used the to be first... a there used to be a play on words in that with that name on television, but that's I digress. I need to look that up too. <laughs> yes, we'll talk about it more. But oh my gosh, guys! Like I I I literally cried from laughing. <laughs> no, like go back and watch. I was literally crying. I will so... because most of my screen was covered up with my script, so I'll have to do. That. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like paying more attention to my facial expressions in the camera than it was to anything else. I was making sure I looked okay. Oh, well, I, you was, know, I, I was no also idea. paying a lot of attention to joining the facial expressions. You guys all did an amazing job. Like, I, I honestly, you guys surpassed my uh, expectations since this was like the first read through we ever did. I was like, oh, you know, we'll just read. Oh my gosh. That was so good. I mean, we awesome had a little prior. bit. Of Huh? Hannah's, Hannah, awesome fryer. Yes. 100%. Thank you. I had, a, I, had a, I had a fryer character in a book where he was an owl. As a matter of fact, it's the Mousy book. Yes, with Brooke. Um, but there's an owl in there. And I had a friend of mine that I thought his voice would be great for it. But he's not, you know, a trained guy. And he was just so nervous. He was so self conscious about how he sounded. He didn't. So I said, okay, I'll take it. And I, I I was trying to farm out as many characters as possible so as not to have to do too many. And but the friar was a fun one. So I liked I liked your rendition of the friar in that. That was really that was really good. Everything Everybody did. Hilarious. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And there were such real moments between all of you. Like there was moments where I actually paused and I was like, that was real. Like you guys brought some realness to a play reading. Like for we didn't even rehearse. What the heck? <laughs> Be Improv. Be dangerous with some rehearsal, huh? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. True. Seriously. This was I, really, really cool. I just think that because we all just came together, none of us rehearsed together, and we just were like, yeah, screw it, let's do it. It just... Right. It, I, I don't know why, but it just brings a rawness to it. It was also fun to watch the different license everybody took with whatever you were doing, how you, you know, how you took it. So that was kind of neat, too, because then... Again, we didn't rehearse, so everything was a surprise to everybody. Yes. Yes. Right. 
That was cool. I love the uh, the masking that you did, Gabe. Yes. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I was really pleased. So my roommates as a prank, like hid a, like while I was gone recently, hid a stack of masks around my room. So I literally had just a, this sitting next to me on my desk. So when I, re- I, I remembered the masked ball and then I saw that in here and I was like, oh my gosh, I've got... I remember mask. too late that I could have used my glasses as a mask earlier. So I was like, oh yeah, it's like Clark Kent with Superman. You're like, oh, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. My gosh, you guys were so creative with, um, uh, like an example, um, when <laughs> Beatrice enters from behind, you were like crawling on the ground. <laughs> like, <"Hello." laughs> I saw your eyes come up. Hello. <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, Natasha, did you, did you, like, that was when you when hero was shamed i really felt that you just really brought it yeah and um miguel you talking to yourself dog dog barry and leonardo so good so good and honestly all your lines michael you you're just you literally are the dons like you are yes essentially (laughs) the dons you You found me on the day of my daughter's wedding Seriously, all the lines I was feeling, every that, single one you've said, so good. It means the world. This is not his first rodeo. You're breaking my heart, Michael. You're breaking no, my it, heart. It, it, <laughs> is, it is my first rodeo in quite some time. Uh, I honestly, for for a lot of us, it's been quite some time. True. It's been a rodeo, yeah, and a half. Yeah, the past two years. I'm absolutely looking forward to more of these with all y'all. Mm-hmm. No, the reading aloud is great fun. And it's, you know, for the voiceover interested folks in the group, um, reading on the fly like that, you know, reading three or four words ahead with your brain mm-hmm. and your mouth, your mouth's over here, but your brain's already on, you know, seven words ahead. Yeah. That that pays off, especially for commercial stuff. Um, but just having that ability to, you know, be reading with your eyes while you're already speaking over here with something else and yet pour into what you're actually saying. That's, mm-hmm. That was pretty cool. I liked how people paused too. Uh, I used to be afraid of going too slow in audiobooks, and I learned that the slow is good because it builds that momentum for moments to happen, mm-hmm. and they kind of create based on how good the writing is, of course. But still, and uh, so that was pretty cool. And believe it or not, for as long as I've been doing audiobooks, I just recently got three tips from the coach that were slow down, read some of the words as if you didn't know what you were going to read. You know, like it was a surprise. Like, you know, the word enraged was in one of my lines there. And I knew when I read it that I should pause and not say that word like I know it's there, but say it like it's the word I just thought of. And I, it reminds us that we speak naturally that way. Yeah. And if we're reading something, we need to read it to sound as if we're thinking and speaking it and not read it as if we're reading it. And I think that's a it's a challenge, but it's part of the skill set. So doing these is great. Great rehearsal all the way around. Great exposure. Great fun. Good surprises. And you guys yeah. are invited to all of these. Uh, we'll be doing more. I'm going to stop the recording there with that great bit of advice. Um, we can stay on and chat, but I'll stop the recording. Thank you so much for watching. Yeah. Woo. More to come. Well, thank, thank you everybody. for inviting. Thank you for inviting and uh, coordinating you. and putting it together. My pleasure. Happy Good to do job. more. Love it.